It's Tim, Pickup Truck Plus SUV Talk, joined by the five foot one of the world, Jill Simonello from Chicago. So I'm back from vacation, fired up for live streams. Sorry, we're going a little early tonight. Somebody, was it dinner reservations you made or something? Yeah. It is, in fact. I, so before we decided to get consistent with the live stream, which really happened in like the last month or so, um, I made reservations for, to go out to dinner with my parents-in-law this evening. And um, so I did it like three months ago because it's a hot new restaurant in Chicago. And apparently this was the first reservation I could get. So um, yeah, that, that's what I'm doing this evening. So you, you get the, um, the, I'm doing something after this, Jill. Right, right. So uh, Jill's smiling and happy. She's having a fantastic evening. Um, I'm going to hop in. I know uh, Jill's going to look this up in a second, but I want to talk about a few things that happened while I was on vacation. Um, one of them is the new truck quality uh, survey from the initial quality survey IQS from our friends at JD Power. That everybody's going to say, they bought the award. They paid the money for the award. They're just, well, that's always how times happens with JD Power. Um, JD Power is like consumer reports, like everybody else. They take a lot of survey results and they go, here, here's the results, and then they put their stuff around it. Uh, so I wanted to go over this because I, uh, it's a load of crap. <laughs> and I'm, so I'm going to tell you why it is. So I'm going to throw it on the screen. Hold on. Okay, first off, say what the JD Power, yeah. like, say how they get their results. Right, right. I'm, I'm going through it. I'm doing the journalist thing. Because you're on, saying man. it's a load of crap, and I'm saying, I'm saying, hold it, your opinion doesn't matter. All right. So here we go. We have J.D. Power Initial Quality Study. They do this every year. They survey all brand new vehicle owners and they get their feedback on problems they've had in the first 90 days. I had an interesting sidebar. I had a, a Toyota salesman actually reach out to me and he goes, I think this is hilarious. Your truck should be great for the first 90 days. Why do they even do the survey? And I had to respond back like, well, the Tundra would have failed that I bought and the Power Boost would have had problems on list on the thing. So yeah, it, 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 new vehicles aren't perfect I mean, you know there's sometimes you get good ones sometimes in my case i've had some pretty well questionable luck um so i think this is hilarious and what i want to say is is they make a big deal in the press release about the pandemic related issues contribute to the overall decline in quality pandemic covid related quality issues toxic cocktail of computer microchip shortages state-of-the-art advanced driving systems and worsening launch vehicle quality dun, dun, dun. It's all terrible, folks. It's all terrible. 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 That's okay, all. come on. Supply chain issues are pretty pretty flipping bad. I know. And then the continuing fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. I get all this stuff. And then you scroll down, and it says the... Oh, hold on. Where's it at? It's right here. The the biggest problem is the problems in the systems. Well, chip shortage. Right. But the, the, the results are that people still have problems connecting to their cell phones. They have problems built-in recognition, they have difficulties with touch screens, display screens, built-in Bluetooth systems, not enough power plugs, USB ports, inconsistent audio volume. Those are the top quality issues plaguing new vehicles. And then- So, the, hold on, hold before on, you move on, 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 no, 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 no. Before you move on, I want to comment on that specifically. Okay. So I think pandemic-related problem that people are citing problems, you know, connecting their cell phones to their car is directly due to the fact that dealerships were not doing in-car um, tutorials with the people that they were selling cars to. So people were buying cars, picking them up and then taking them home. And they're like, what the hell do I do now? Because previously somebody buys a car and at least whenever I bought a new car, um, the person who's selling you the car sits down with you and says, this is how you plug your phone into the car so that you can connect to Apple CarPlay. Sure. That's going to be a culprit of it, but is that, okay. really a, is that a quality issue? It is a quality issue because it's perception of how you deal with the vehicle. Okay. So let's continue on quality issues because the biggest quality issues are the battery electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles because they have more electronics. According to the survey, significantly worse because they have more, like more problems with vehicles with owners ICE. And they excluded Tesla because Tesla they never get enough um, responses. So what they're saying is EV powertrain is less complex. The relative simplicity doesn't necessarily translate better quality. And they said it was due to, well, I saw it, more tech, well, I mean, there's more technology in battery EVs anyways. But I, I find that really interesting. Um, and what they look at for quality, look at you know, attainment features, all this kind of stuff. And I just, I guess my thing with it is, I appreciate the frustration you have 
when your phone doesn't connect to your car the way you want it to. All in. I get that. Okay. And the average new consumer price or age is between 45 to 70. So we are dealing with some older individuals who may not always be up in the latest technology. And I've had trouble with some press loans getting my phone to connect at times. So I mean, I told it with some of this stuff. But when you make it all this pandemic related stuff for quality, and then it's about the entertainment system. Sorry. I think that 100% is a pandemic issue. And it all goes back to the fact that dealers are not doing consumer education. Well, I, when I, I bought, it, when it, I bought it, my I think... truck, I had the dealer show me this stuff. I you mean, are I, in a, in the, the Ford, the the Ford weird place called Nebraska where COVID didn't exist. But for the rest <laughs> of us who lived in a place that were on lockdown for two truck. years, like I went with a friend as she bought a car. Um, she bought a Toyota. And the dude like was just literally like, here you go. Here's your keys. Bye. And then she looks at me and she was like, what do I do now? And and this is like a friend of my mother-in-law's. And, um, and, and like months later, like I was telling my mother, because my mother-in-law bio, borrows her car. And I was like, she's like, I just really wish this had navigation. I'm like, um, it does. It's called Apple CarPlay. And she's like, what do you mean Apple CarPlay? And I was like, there's a lot of anger there, but you plug your phone in and your map is mirrored from your phone onto your car. And she was like, what? And I was like, did they not tell, you know, your friend about this? She was like, no. And I was like, Okay. And so then I like gave them both the walkthrough of what Apple CarPlay is. And they're like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. But they were really pissed off in the first 90 days because mm -hmm. they didn't realize that Apple CarPlay existed. And if somebody hasn't bought a car in eight to 10 years, which by the way, the average time somebody keeps their car is eight to 10 years in America. So you're not turning over cars every day. You're not seeing all the latest and greatest technology. So the last time you bought a car was in um, 2014. I have to tell you, things are very different. Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing is, a car now is like a walking computer or a driving mm -hmm. computer. I mean, it's full of tech. And so I think that that's what you're going to see. Um, I, I guess that's my beef is that I wish the quality surveys were split up a little bit differently to say, to take out the entertainment a little bit as far as how much it impacts the new vehicle's quality. Because those are easily fixable problems. Now, if you have torn seats, you have cracked, uh, the guy cracked his seat, the plastic on his Tundra. Mm -hmm. If you have, you know, a variety of those issues, I think I want those issues to stand up more because those can be fixed by the automaker. That's their, on their thing. But, you know, to me, I think we're going to keep seeing quality go down because we're going to see more and more consumers with more cell phones getting vehicles and lining stuff up. We're going to see more technology in vehicles. So if we're going to qual we're going to have quality based on technology, then we're going to see continuing drops in quality. Okay, Which and so if you, if you want to talk about quality, let's dig into this just a little bit more. So um, I don't know if you saw on the like down on the press release where they talked about um, the uh, top models per segment. And did you see? So do you want me? And, and maybe you and I are not looking at the same press release, but it's the same information. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 2022 U.S. Initial Quality Study. Um, I asked him for the link, by the way, and he was like, just Google that. You'll find it. And so I clearly found something different than what you found. Um, and, and mine well, is were, better than yours. You asked me like two seconds before we went live. Whatever. You already have the link, you know, queued up All so right. that you can put it on your thing. Blah, blah, All you have to do was cut and paste. Not that hard, dude. All right. So what are you looking at? You want to talk about technology issues. Um, all right. So when you get to the um i wonder if i can share my window let's see um because mine mine has a prettier image than yours does uh so let's see in the wake of the covid 19 pandemic initial vehicle quality notably declined in 2022 really that's really your takeaway okay, that a so virus made you not connect your phone to the car oh that's making it small again so i'm like i don't think i can make it any bigger than that but so looking at the um pickup truck area. Mm -hmm. So the highest ranked in terms of initial quality was the Ford Ranger, then the Gladiator, then the Colorado. Mm -hmm. All three vehicles have been in the market for a really long time. So those are going to be the least technologically forward vehicles. Then you look at um, light duty pickup truck, you have Silverado, Sierra, and then F-150. Again, Silverado and Sierra, um, I think this study had to have been done before the refresh came out with the Google powered Android system. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, yeah. we'll um, probably see quality have... go down because of that. 
Yeah. So then you have the F-150, which um, has been out for a couple of years now. So then you go to heavy duty again, Silverado, Super Duty, GMC, Sierra, all trucks that have been um, in the market for a while. You know what's not on this list? Hmm. The Toyota Tundra. So therefore, I am going to reiterate, not bunk. No, I think it's bunk. All right. Um, well, I, you know, I just, like I said, I think that, I think infotainment is going to be the next frontier in overall quality and designers have to work really hard to make their systems work as seamless as they can with other people's, with other people's thought process, right? So we all connect things differently. Like you said with your friend, I mean, I have a friend who's 75 and I have to take him to a Verizon here pretty soon because his flip phone won't work because they're going to discontinue the service to it. And my father-in-law just bought a new smartphone last year. And my uncle bought a new smartphone because he actually bought a Toyota Sienna and he wanted to connect to the app on the vehicle and he had to trade in his old flip phone to be able to connect to the app of the vehicle. So, you know, it's, he's got two things. He's got new cell phone, new technology, plus new vehicle apps technology and trying to make sense of all the thing working. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's just going to be interesting to see how it works out. I just don't, uh, I don't like, love the idea that initial quality is so focused on cell phone connectivity but but i mean that's where people's brains are and that's what people are commenting on and and it, it does stink because initial quality should have to do with crack seats which by the way i think that's one of the reasons why toyota isn't on there but um you know i i i this is the way we're going and you and i've had this conversation before that you know this right here is um basically like you know your car is this on wheels and i mean I, I don't know. I, I don't think people are going to be keeping their cars eight to 10 years um, anymore. You made a comment a couple weeks, no, maybe a month ago that a viewer of this channel keeps bringing up to me all the time. He's like, you know, I think more I think about it, more, I think Jill was right. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> here we go. And Thank he, you. Says, he says, because at one time, maybe a month or two ago, you said that cars are becoming um, uh, throwaway appliances. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. I mean, as, as expensive as they are, it's it's just like that's what it's become. And uh, I wanted to I wanted to bring up something on the channel because we were talking about this seat issue, and I'm not sure people know what's going on with that. So um, I ran a video. Let me see. I ran a video here. It's uh, the far on the right. It says crack seat already. It's unbelievable. Crack seat on 2022 Toyota Tundra after 5,000 miles. Now I took some grief about that because people are like that's sensationalizing the headline, and you're just profiteering off this guy's stuff and i was like no i thought it was kind of interesting that he cracked his seat already i mean this is i thought it was interesting right so th this is an interesting question for you joe um i got and i'll say this as well i got emails afterwards from other owners i've gotten two now with crack seats as well hmm. and so there was a couple things came out of that and this is an interesting question the gentleman in the video was five foot eleven 243 pounds and he said it on camera. I didn't ask him. He just said, there's so much a way. That's what I'm saying. And so people on the comments were saying, well, obviously he's obese. He's got to lose about 65 pounds to be able to use. The, and I'm like, what? so I was like, so the trucks have weight limits now when you buy a vehicle? You I know, know not everybody is going to be my size. Let me just put that out there. Right. I mean, I was just, I was shocked by that response. And I was like, okay, what? hold on a minute. So you're going to have this, all this criticism of this guy because he weighs too much. And then other people pointed out that other brands have the same problem. Silverado's, Rams, Ford, they all are breaking that same spot. And so I think it's interesting and I want to do a follow-up video on this and I'll maybe do it some at a time is that I think as, as cabs have gotten taller, right? So cabs have gotten taller because you want more headroom. Mm -hmm. Trucks have gotten taller because you want more, because you have to raise the belt line of the bed to match the cab, right? So now we have these trucks that are higher off the ground, which means um, a lot of guys, including me, have to use running boards to get in and out of the vehicle because they've gotten so tall. And so now I'm wondering if we're going to have like a pandemic of broken seats because guys are sliding out of the truck a lot more often now than they used to be because you have to slide your butt over, get on the step rail and get off versus before when trucks were lower, you just put your foot out, stepped up and you walked away. So I, 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 it kind of was a interesting thing that allowed me to keep thinking more and more about it and saying you know what interesting interesting i don't know if that's it it's an ongoing thing well i mean granted i don't weigh you know more than 100 pounds but 
I always slide out of my vehicles. If I can't touch the ground when I just swing around, like I'm always like sliding down. Um, yeah. And I mean, we own a GTI, so clearly not a problem in our GTI because I can just and step well, up. GTI is already really low to the ground too. I mean, yeah. yeah. So I would be, I would be very curious if we had an SUV or a truck over the long term, if even somebody my size would cause that crack because I'm sliding down. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I've done million mile vehicles before and a lot of guys tell me that they, they never slide across. They step in the, they step on the bar, they put their feet in, they kind of basically climb into the truck, then they sit down. So the g- gentleman that I've, uh, uh, I can't remember his name. He's got million mile and a 50,000, 500,000 miles on a Sierra. Mm-hmm. I, just, I was talking to him about it and, and he's, his seats were perfect because he did that. And so, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting question whether or not, it's going to happen on future vehicles. If it's going to happen, if it's become more of a pandemic with, or use the pandemic word, but more of an issue long term with with newer vehicles because they've gotten taller. Is that a is that going to be a byproduct of that? Um, yeah. So Todd, our friend Todd says that the crack doesn't ha- does not happen. The side seat bolster will bend down and lose its support, which I've seen that too. Yeah. Uh, my friend's got seven hundred thousand miles on a Ford Expedition. He's got to get a new seat because he's six six eight, two hundred fifty pounds. And he just slides over in a bolster and it's just, it's gotten completely ripped apart. So, and I've seen at the Ford I did, the guy, um, he was probably 140 pounds and his seat was all destroyed too. So I don't know. It, it's interesting to, to think about this. I guess it's what I love about the truck world is that we can dive in the hybrid and electric trucks and this, that, and the other. But then they were still having these really weird fundamental problems with these vehicles that just doesn't get talked about as much as I think it should. I think we should talk more about the stuff and we should demand better from automaker. I mean, people are saying, well, you know, he's too fat, whatever. And I'm like, no, no it's 5,000 miles in a truck. <laughs> like we got to demand better. We get for your dollar. You got to demand better. Um, yeah. I just, I think it's, that's what I found fascinating about that. Um, I wanted to uh, address a couple things. Somebody said JD power. They wish they'd saw vehicles with 5,000, five years and 60,000 miles. There are some, you can go to carcomplaints.com and look through some of those findings. We do some, we do some reliability stuff on that age. The, the, the reason I've never done video on that is because it depends on the pride of ownership of the owner in mm-hmm. that if you get two trucks, they're bought a lot from two different owners. One guy takes care of his truck. The other guy doesn't. Then you really have an unfair apples, apples comparison because one can look really destroyed. So like I go to my, I went to my Ford dealer and we were checking out different trucks and he had a variety of used trucks out there. And some of them look great and same brand look terrible. Because it's up to how the unit owner takes care of it. So it's so hard to do five years or 10 years or whatever because of that. And also because of the fact that you're going to see engines change quite a bit. I've, I said for a while, this 3.5 liter V6 that, that the new Tundra has, max 10-year engine. Max. It has too much emission still. It's still with a small displacement. I mean, it's gonna that one's going to go away. It's going to be hybrid only. It's going to be smaller displacement. They can find ways to get more um, horsepower and torque out of smaller engines. And so if, so if you said, hey, I want to see a truck that's 100,000 miles, new Tundra, how long it lasts? Well, if you put 10,000 miles in a year, that's 10 years, the engine's gone. So by the time you're like, I got the results, then the truck no longer exists. Right. <laughs> it's, it doesn't it always, it doesn't make sense. Um, there was something about, oh, uh, he's asked a few times, Ojeda Adventures, talking about why isn't GMC released a full body photos of the EB at Sierra? Your guess is as good as ours. Product rollout is a whole mystery behind the curtain stuff and product planning. The other thing that, that people talk about a lot, they're like, you know, I did the Tundra TRD pro. We did that in Texas and people said, well, why are you guys covering trucks? You can't even buy. Well, understand that product planning does not work completely with manufacturing. And so product planning has got to keep push, pushing stuff out and manufacturing just getting caught up. That's just what's going to happen. So, but, but I do want to say, um, if you want an idea of what the GMC EV Sierra is going to look like, yeah, look at the <laughs> look at the Silverado EV. That's and it's good. probably going to be pretty much the same with just a different badge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's going to have better materials inside, but that's going to be that's just going to be what it's going to be. I mean, you're going to see that happen. All right. Um, then I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about. Did I have it on? I want to talk about, uh, not yet. I want to, hold on. I got to remove that. I have something to talk about with that. Um, oh, I didn't show up. <laughs> it's kind of a mess today. It's a new early starting time Jill's got me on. It's got me all messed up. Yeah, so, yeah, whatever. 
as you guys know, I need to buy a new truck. Okay. So this is part of the conversation. And I was looking at stuff today going, you know what? The only new trucks coming out are going to be Colorado, uh, a Ford Ranger eventually, a GMC Canyon. We're thinking, you know, sometime soon. So a lot of midsize trucks. And I was like, you know, I don't know if they qualify. And so then, aha, I went over here and I searched. So I use a Section 179 vehicle. That's is the, the, the IRS tax deduction for trucks. And this is why people are always like, well, you should go buy a new uh, small SUV or something. Well, this is why I don't. Because any vehicle at least 6,000 pounds GVWR, but no, no more 14,000 pounds. So anything 6,000 pounds to 14,000 pounds. This includes many full-size SUVs, commercial vans, pickup trucks, right? So, I mean, full-size pickup trucks typically, right? 6,000 pounds. And then I got to looking and I was thinking, well, wait a minute. All these off-road trucks have lots of extra stuff on them, right? So, boom. I was looking at the GVWR of the current 2022 Chevy Colorado. And what do I see? The diesel, which is a heavier engine than the gas engine anyways, and the Z71, which has more off-road skid plates and things, from factory is 6,100 pounds. Oh. <laughs> so the question is going to be, will the Colorado be out in time for you to buy it? Always with the buzzkill. <laughs> That's know, what I do. I, I just about call about me buzzkill, chill. I was, thinking, I was thinking, well, wait a minute here. What if it is, though? What if, what if mid-sized truck's actually an option? I mean, if it's an option, I think that would be I think that would be a cool a, a cool thing to do. Right, because I'd, I'd I'd have that I'd have the Silverado EV truck next year whenever I get that or E truck. Well, and and plus, like if you did the Colorado, um, like ZR2 or just Colorado whatever Z, ZL1 or whatever the trim was you were looking yeah, at, um, the the alphabet soup of trims. Um, if you did that, then as um, like the Tacoma. To, that Tacoma comes out, the Sierra comes out, the Ranger comes out, like you would have potentially a truck to do comparisons with. Yeah. I, now, I may have to buy two because I think the ZR2, I don't know, depending on the price, depending on which one I get, because I need to have a certain, I need to have a certain number I spent or I pay even more taxes. So I'm working on that one too. I need to either pay Trick more. Trick it up out front with all of the options. Or buy more. It's, it's kind of buy more truck or just pay more quarterly. It's just it's the game, right? So that was interesting. I was like, I was like, you know what? I haven't owned a mid-sized truck since 1997, I think. So I think it's 97, then 98, somewhere in that range. I think so. Maybe even older than that. I don't remember. Maybe 2000s. I don't know. It all goes together. Anyways, so I was thinking, well, which one would you be more excited about was kind of my question. So if you were me and you're thinking, man, I could actually buy a midsize truck. So you have Colorado and we're going to be, the, even though they do a Z, ZR2 version, they'll do a ZR2 Bison version again. They'll do a Z71 version, that kind of stuff. Or you have the Canyon, which is going to be kind of mirrored. You can do Denali Canyon. I don't really want to do that. But Or you have Ford Ranger or, or the Tacoma. Now, I don't think I can get Tacoma and Ranger because I think they're both going to come out next year. Mm -hmm. it wasn't our wasn't then we do a story in port ranger what to expect and it was like a 2024 or something like that yeah i i think tacoma and ranger are both 2024 yeah but if i kept the colorado for a year i would have the opportunity to you know do comparisons those two hmm. so i guess yeah what, what do you guys think what do you guys i mean i i, I don't know i kind of like the colorado i had a lot of fun this year too a lot of fun these are two bison um, if they can do that new interior like they have in the Sierra and the Silverado, that may be interesting. And yes, Todd, if I do keep doing analysis paralysis, it will be 2025. But <laughs> yeah. um, he says, if you keep doing analysis paralysis, 2025 should be out. Uh, it does. That's, the thing you understand, this is a business. And so I got to think, I got to think strategically in the business. Um, so Colorado V6 or the diesel. I want to, I want to address this really quick. Because Dave says he's they're going to be 2023s, and if they were 2023s, they'd already be an out, out by now. We would already know about them. And um, and plus, they've already announced 2023 Tacoma packages. So that's definitely 2024. Um, and I think Ranger is also going to be 2024. Yeah, I'm assuming that's what he's referencing. But, I mean, the, the Colorado could come out in July. But I think the Colorado will be 23. I think it'll be 23, but it'll be late yeah. availability 23. That's going to be my problem. And I think it'll be 
late for me. Excuse me. I think it'll be in late the holiday availability 23. in 2022. You're right. I think it'll be. I think it'll be maybe December, most likely September, October. So I mean, because the Tundra came out last July, wasn't it? July. We got the reveal stuff maybe August, and then mm -hmm. it. I was able to buy mine in December. Uh, so Dave says all Ranger starts production in March of next year. Yeah, it'll so be definitely 2024. 20, 20, 20, 20, it'll be 2024, 20, I think. Um, it has to be because if it were 20, like they, they would not start production. Like they, they haven't done the reveal yet. It just, it, I, I just, it can't possibly be. Well, so a lot of times they'll do is they'll start production, but then they'll take the first couple vehicles over to advertising and marketing and they'll take them to us first drive. And then mm -hmm. they, they may, they may launch that. 23 in july of the model year i mean that's always a possibility too i mean they don't i mean and plus the model years are all messed up right now <laughs> they're they're all confusing uh yeah they have the bronco yeah i i could see them i could see them doing all sorts of weird stuff at the worst is range rover range rover always get the years are all weird every time i get a range rover i don't know what the deal is with that the british ah um at least they didn't say 24 and a half 23 and a half. <laughs> yeah. We used to be back in the day, a little half year. Or, or what's worse is have like a limited model. That's actually the previous generation with the current model year on it. That was completely whack. That is not that bad of a deal. That's whack. They have been doing that for a long time. You're, I mean, Rand's are doing it now for what going on three years. But, but they've now done it for three years. Now the or the Silverado limited, I think is no more. Like they, as soon as they came out with the official, right, you so know, they model the for the stuff, yeah. They, they, um, they were like, okay. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. Um, Ojita wants to know why didn't GM build a Blazer like 1994 K1500 Blazer? Easy cafe. They can't. That, that vehicle doesn't meet emissions. Doesn't meet corporate air fuel economy. There's no way they can build that. Now every time they build that, and they'd pay fines. Um, same thing happened to the Toyota FJ Cruiser. Same thing happened to uh, the, the original Ford Bronco, the big one. That's why the new Ford Bronco is lighter, turbocharged engine, because they have to. They have to at this point. Um, yeah, under the state under the state of things, I guess there's no no longer such thing as year end deals, and there there isn't. I don't think I don't think I'm find incentives or deals for quite a while. But there are some. That have it like I I feel like Ram has incentives right now on their trucks. Actually, there are some random vehicles that have incentives, and you know, I mean, not a truck, but the Chevrolet Bolt EUV has like a cash incentive right now because they're lowering their price for 2023. Um, so their 2022 models like will give you six thousand dollars back or something like that. So I mean, I think there are rare instances, but not widespread incentives like we used to see. I, I mean, I used to I came out of classifieds. I, I as I used to be the automotive editor at a, a newspaper and was I was in the classified section. So we would always run the list of incentives every week. And um, and it was like pages of incentives from local and federal, you know, national, I guess, dealers. And, you know, that that is now like meh, instead of. Meh. Yeah, I, it, it, it is interesting. But, you know, I ran that sales report and Ram did not sell as many, nearly as many trucks as everybody else was sold. No, and there's they're sitting on lots a lot too. So people are just not buying them. Like that, I mean, that goes back to the story that I wrote about which vehicle, which trucks could you buy right now? And Ram was one of those trucks. Yeah, and I, I'm kind of confused by that because, I mean, it's been a solid truck. I'm pulling up the stat, stats right now, so I'll throw them on the screen. So yeah, I mean, Ram, oh, of course, an odd pops up since I. <laughs> We're ad supported, folks. Gotta like the ads. All right, so uh, Ram was down 28. percent They did not sell much volume. And I do wonder if people are waiting to know if the 2023 model is going to be changed at all, which I was hoping is going to be changed, but I think I'm wrong. I uh, put a thing on the uh, I put a thing on the 2023, which I expect Ram story, because I think it's going to be 2024 at this point. And so, yeah, I mean, you're, you're just not seeing the volume there. And I'm surprised because, again, it's a good truck. And somebody says Ram truck prices are too high now. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, there's still a conversation about the Ranger, but... Uh, uh, John Radliff wants to know, hello, appreciate your channel. Question, I have a bulletproof 2018 Tundra 5.7 liter. If what you said about trucks becoming disposable, they just keep my current tr truck. Ooh, that's an interesting question. So um, there's been a longstanding 
concern over turbocharged engines in the forum world, in the Facebook world, in the social media world. And frankly, from our research on this, we just haven't found it to be the case. We've actually, for example, Ford has done the 3.5 liter EcoBoost for many, many years. And we've actually found that the 5.0 liter V8 was more unreliable than the twin turbocharged engine. So, um, you know, my thinking is this, is if you like your truck and you believe it's bulletproof and you believe in it, then don't. Yeah, keep it, keep it. <laughs> keep it. I mean, because the thing is, I guarantee you, once you sell that truck, you're going to regret it. it. Just every time I talk to somebody doing that, it's just regret it. Um, and I would say, when I say that vehicles are becoming disposable, I think it's more cars rather than trucks. Because I think a lot of truck owners buy their vehicles for a purpose, whether it's the engine power to tow, whether it's, you know, the ability to put stuff in the bed. And if they're comfortable with it, like, and they like how it's operating, I see truck, like, I would love to see a study of how long truck owners keep their vehicles versus how long, like, sedan and, um, like, SUV owners keep their vehicles. Because my guess is truck owners probably keep their vehicles longer. Yeah, so I, and I can't find the study. You and I were um, discussing this air quotes earlier and uh, this week. Um, the study I found said that most average car consumers were three to four and a half years, and trucks were like five to seven. Yeah, and and I the the, the study I found said eight years. So I, I actually it was like eight to twelve years. So I, I don't know what you know we were looking at that was so very you know vastly different. But and I think it's interesting because the average age of vehicle fleet in the United States has never been older. I think that's that story. I mean, people are holding on their vehicles longer because they're not having catastrophic engine issues like we used to. The engine okay. used to be 100,000 miles. It was junk. Now our engine's lasting longer. I think the biggest problem we run into is that people are going to be bored with the vehicle after a while. It wants to be new and setting different. You know, I had an uncle who had a Bronco from like 1970, put a bunch of money in it, drove it for like 15 years, and he sold it. I said, why did you sell it? He goes, just got bored with it. I want something different, you know. I mean, and I, I could see that, right? You have the same thing year after year after year, and so I think it's interesting. Um, you see that more and more. My concern is always electronics when we get up the age of vehicles and whether stuff works or not. But you know, that's just that's going to be. So that was my that was my question for you guys. Uh, put comments down below. Colorado Frontier, not Frontier, but Colorado. Circling back Colorado, to the truck that Tim yeah, should buy in Ranger. case somebody has just joined us. <laughs> We we went on a very large tangent. Um, so his question is: Now you can state it. Yes, yes. Which what 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 are you guys excited for? Are you guys excited for midsize trucks? Would you guys watch midsize truck videos? This is oh, lots of questions. Um, but yeah. So what motor do you expect is coming in New Colorado? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know that they're going to make any sort of big changes. There was a rumor that the two point eight liter diesel is going away. That's because the facility that that built it, the plant, was in Thailand. And basically, the plants, I'm going to say, the story was murky, but my best guess is that their lease was up in the building they had, or mm -hmm. they had to move, or the company shut down, or whatever. And so for about a week there, a week or two weeks, they were talking about killing the engine, but they found a new place to manufacture the engine. Because that's a global, the 2.8 liter is a global engine. They use it, Colorado is sold globally as well. So um, that's going to be, I think, what's going to happen. I think they'll have... The three six V six. I don't know. I, I think it's all going turbocharged. I think you'll either have a turbocharged option or you're going to have a diesel option. I don't think they're going to have anything else. There is a question about the a hybrid midsize truck. Uh, that's interesting. I think. Well, I don't well, know. I never did it right. Well, so here's the thing: Chevrolet has done hybrid trucks before and failed miserably. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're too excited to dip their foot back in that pond um you know so I, I mean maybe i i don't know i've been on a tear lately i want to see a plug-in hybrid truck yeah <laughs> you've been writing about it uh i think let me make a blanket statement i think all four-cylinder engines that aren't turbo are dying are going away so uh philip wants to know you think they get rid of the 2.7 four-cylinder in a tacoma yes I think in, if it's not turbo, if it's not hybrid, if it's not diesel, which Toyota is not going to do diesel because they hate it globally for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, if, if, if it's going to be hybrid or it's going to be a turbo. that's I, I think it's going to be that. both. Yeah, it could I be think both that, too. I think the Tacoma is going to have a hybrid version. That's my prediction um, because of, um, simply because the Tundra has one. 
Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think for sure you're going to see that. And I wouldn't be surprised if that hybrid option in the Tacoma is the only choice. Like, there's there. I feel like that's going to be more and more pushing the envelope and stuff, and you know, going to force you to do stuff. Well, all right, we saw it today. We were discussing over email the mm -hmm. Jeep Grand Cherokee in the Trailhawk trim level, just the one trim level. I, I'm, for a minute, it's going to be the it's going to be the four by e plug in hybrid only. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to do a V8 option in that. You won't be able to do anything else in that. It's going to go only that option. I think we're going to see that automakers are going to use statements like, well, we're going to cost more, more power and torque, which is what they want. We're going to cost more, more fuel economy, which is what they want. We're just we're doing right for the customer. And you're going to see these V8s slowly get, they're going to go away in a way that people aren't going to be so upset with, in that you're going to find less and less availability on dealer lots for these things. You'll find less and less options for these in certain trim levels. They're just going to be really sneaky. Marketing's going to be really sneaky about getting rid of that V8 just through a progression of just dropping at certain trim levels. I but think but did the Grand throughout. Cherokee have a V8? I think it only had a V6, didn't it? I was thinking about that too. And maybe I need to double check that. But uh, I thought it had for a while. Because we just drove, I, I think for the next gen, I don't I think, think it has a V8. Million. Yeah, and we it, just drove the 4xe in Wisconsin. The review is on our channel. You should check it out. Yeah, you can get it in the Summit. You can get Grand Cherokee L in the Summit, and you can get the Overland and Overland in the 57 Hummy. It, it, are they all L models, or are they the two-row? That's what I got. So you can the top ones. No, there's a mix. There's four of them listed. Two have Ls next to them, which is the longer wheelbase, and two don't have Ls. So, and that's, uh, that's just me Googling. That's without me okay. going into jeep.com and going, uh, doing all the, my, what I should be doing research. Doing it correctly. Yes. But I mean, I have 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Summit 5.7 V8. And I feel like that, I feel like that was something they were uh, offering. So okay. I think, I think you'll find in my opinion, how I'm looking at stuff is you're going to start seeing more and more turbo engines. You'll see more and more hybrid engines and you'll see more and more like the Hemi. So Elliot says the, uh, he says that he says it has a V6 and Hemi. The Hemi is only on the top trims, and I think you'll see that Hemi start getting more and more pushed away, and and just from a marketing standpoint, I think that's what's going to happen. Well, and I mean, we just posted a story this evening about the Dodge Hornet um, that they will probably be revealing at the um, Dodge Week that's coming up in August, and. We've there, there have been some spy shots that have gone out. Um, there have been um, some renderings that have been done. We um, believe it's going to be built on the Tenali, um, the Alfa Romeo Tenali platform. Um, and I think that is a prime example of where Dodge, Jeep, Ram, you know, anything that was hemified is going is more turbo and then this will have a plug-in hybrid option as well so i i and, and during the dodge speed week they are also going to be at, like having some product announcements as well as like some they call it like a bridge announcement so i expect more plug-in hybrids and then they're going to have um the future product announcement so i know dodge is coming out with an electric muscle car um, they kind of revealed that last year at the EV day, which was pretty much exactly a year ago. I think it was July 8th last year that they did their, um, 2021 EV day. Um, so I, I just, yeah, I think, I think the Hemi, I think you're right. I think the Hemi is going away. I think you're going to, I think Dodge is going to start to adopt some of the plug-in hybrid, um, technology that we see in Jeep. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing more EVs. Yeah, I think we're going to see more and more. And turbos have gotten so much more reliable than they ever used to be. And again, guys, I, we've done reliability stories, and I've never found many problems with turbos. And I, Tebow the first points out turbos won't last nearly as long as natural aspirated engines. Sure, but I just I haven't seen that be the case. I haven't seen any statistical data that backs it up. And honestly, semi trucks, semi trucks are getting millions of miles of turbocharged diesel engines. So I don't know. I just I'd love to have more data behind that to make that proven or not. But I, I hear that sentiment and I, I understand it's out there. Um, I, I just put the homepage because I thought it'd be interesting to talk about the homepage. We're not doing a news recap anymore, uh, truck news recap, because there's some interesting stuff on this. We have the, the Toyota Tundra recall, which, by the way, uh, right next to me, I have the safety recall envelope I got in the mail <laughs> from Toyota. This is for the 
panoramic view monitor system, and I have the one for another one. Another, I thought I had another recall on my app, and then I maybe that's the same one. And then I have the, uh, I have the recall notice on my app for the loose truck nuts and loose axle nuts. Um, which, by the way, I think this is related to that YouTube story. If you guys followed Tundra at all, a gentleman had his Tundra and the axle fell off while he was driving. Not a bad thing. <laughs> so uh, I need to take it and have it have it done. And I just I was on vacation and didn't have a guy around to it. And plus, I, I kind of wait for a press loan that way. Just drop the truck off if I can come back home and use something else. Um, we have the main story here, which is kind of funny how it popped up the main story. I'm going to get that in a second. I'm going to go to the right. We have Ford trademark Thunder for trucks. What if it's a PHEV trim? So Jill's been on this thing about plug-in hybrid truck. So if you guys don't know, uh, automakers are going more and more hybrid electricity and it just what's happening. And we've gone from gasoline to straight battery EV trucks. And it would be nice to have an in-between thing, like a hybrid, like a plug-in hybrid, offer more options. I think in a truck market, I think it makes even more sense because then you reap the benefits of getting, because I mean, again, Tim and I argue about this all the time. Mm -hmm. And so you reap the benefits of electrification for around town driving, but then you can still tow, go long distances. You don't have to wait five hours at a charging station, you know, to, to right, charge right. up your vehicle. You know, you you don't have to stop every hundred miles to, to get a charge. Um, so to me, I think a plug-in hybrid truck would make so much sense as automakers are trying to start bridge that gap um, between um, gas and EV. Yeah, I, I think it's. I think that's got to be the case, and so I, I would like to see that too. I think I feel like we've just we've skipped over a step there, like mm -hmm. getting to that point. And then the main story we have: what's stopping electric trucks from mainstream adoption? Now, I will point out that's a story that Jill asked me to write, and so I wrote it. <laughs> and then that was our week discussing the finer points of the story. Yes. No, I feel like all day yesterday uh, we argued a lot. Um, I, I, I should screen grab our, our chat at some point and put it into the my story. Um, but, you know, the, you were also on. So in my other life, I'm going to do a little plug for my for my other thing. In my other life, I'm also I do I talk about car stuff and I'm on a podcast called Car Stuff. Um, and it's the Consumer Guide Automotive Car Stuff podcast. And we actually had Tim on as a guest this, today. So you mm -hmm. want to make sure that you download that and um, listen to it um, because he's talking about this article, which I think I'm very glad you wrote it. I'm very glad we argued about it. Now, why is it that you think that uh, pickup trucks are not you know, going to be electric? Electric pickup trucks aren't going to be adopted mainstream? Yeah, let's, let's do the reasons real fast. Um... And I'll click on that because I think it was, it was interesting. So um, I think we're both right and we're probably both a little wrong on things because, well, we have different backgrounds, different points of view. And that, I think it's one of the things that makes the channel so good is that we see things differently and allows us to talk about them from different viewpoints. Um, we got a lot of interesting feedback on Twitter and Facebook and such. People either agreed or didn't agree. Didn't agree. They, had, they had real reasons for why they're disagreeing. And, and there were things that... I should have talked about. So one of the things that um, make sure I talk before I get too deep in this article is I didn't talk about politics on this because I feel like um, EVs have become very political and they've yep. become a lightning rod for many people. And I just feel like at the end of the day, smart consumers will push aside the politics and they'll do more pen and paper, you know, math. How much am I saving in gas? How much am I saving for? I mean, you know, I, I don't love the idea of EVs as much as everybody else loves. I realize I'm one of the few journalists in the world that, isn't goo goo gaga over this stuff. And I realize I take a lot of crud from my colleagues over it, but I, I just, I look, I'm, I'm too, I'm very practical when I look at stuff. So one of the reasons I, I, I kind of was thinking was real world range. And um, this is something I've been really focused on lately is I've been really watching a lot of YouTube videos on EV, EV trucks, especially from new consumers, new buyers, because I'm, I'm trying to figure out this new customer because I'm gonna tell you right now, they do not sound like the average typical truck guy to me. I mean, it's confusing to me. They they talk a lot about like there's one talking about the different apps and whether Tesla or Rivian had the better app. I had another guy talk about um, he was talking about the zero sixty time and the Rivian how much he loved it, which is it's fast. It's going to be fast. It's EV only. But then he you know started making the point where he was talking about the the screen, all the cool stuff on the screen. So we had fast. We had the big big infotainment screen. And then he talked, the only thing he said was uh, something about the frunk, how he, he stopped putting stuff in the frunk because he kept doing a 060 test because what happened to stuff in the frunk. 
<laughs> so you like the you like the mid tunnel gear tunnel thing better. I mean, but not once did he talk about the bed. Not once did he talk about towing. Not once did he talk about anything besides those things. And what I found a lot of those some of those consumers I've been watching is they traded in their Model Threes or Model Ss or they traded in the Tesla mm-hmm. Model Y. And so, in my view, we're getting a much different consumer than we have in the past. And so I think I think that's a little bit different. I think they look at things a little bit differently too. So real world range, you know, it's interesting. If I were to tell you that the Tundra gets 22 miles per gallon and has 560 miles of range, um, I think most truck guys would go, oh, come on. I mean, what, what do you get in the average? What do you get in the snow? What do you get in uphill? What do you get downhill? You know, what, what do you really get? What do you really get, right? I mean, and, and the thing is, like I tell people, like, don't look at the, the range on the vehicle because all it's doing is mile per gallon divided by gas tank size. I mean, it's ridiculous. But now with EVs, We've all of a sudden made it accurate. So, if, so if the Ford Lightning gets 300 miles of range, well, gosh darn it, that's 300 miles of range. And what we're seeing on the highway, especially, they're seeing it, you know, a, a considerable drop. So, like TFL has their Lightning, and I've been watching a lot of stuff as well. Um, they bought Lightning, drove back in Dearborn, they got 270 miles of range, and so they got less range than was stated because that's how range works. Well, in the estimate. Whenever EPA is testing vehicles, and I'm assuming they're doing the same thing for electric vehicles, they're basically testing in a vacuum. They're going at a constant speed, which is usually 55 miles an hour. And I don't know anybody who actually drives 55 miles an hour on a highway, especially because, like, going down to Indianapolis, speed limit is 70. Yeah. I'm not going to drive 55 miles an hour. Well, Wayne Curtis, I know one person (laughs) who is probably going to drive 50, actually 45 miles an hour. um, Because, by the way, I've been in the car with him when he's been pulled over going 45 miles an hour in a 75 mile an hour zone. Um, But but people are not going to go 55 miles an hour. You know, they're going to go 70. They're going to go 80. And, you know, they're, they're going a lot faster than what the EPA tests at. I would like to see the EPA do these tests at actual like highway speeds, frankly. And then I think things would start getting more accurate. Yeah. But, you know, and once you, and you start getting into mountains and elevation and, you know, that completely wrecks your range. I, I, when I drove the Hyundai Ioniq, um, we were driving basically up into the mountains for the first half of our trip. And I drove 45 miles and used 90 miles of range. You want to yeah. talk about... Ah, range anxiety. Like yeah. I, it kind of yeah. And I feel like we're going to have a lot of a lot of surprise consumers when mm-hmm. they realize that 300 miles is an estimated range. It's not real. Yeah, I don't understand where that. It, but if you read these comments and stuff, it's become real. It, it's the de facto number. Another reason. Another talk about is towing range, and it's building on real world driving. And, and there's there's going to be always going to be some ongoing discussion about who actually tows, who actually doesn't tow. But regardless of that, towing range is is dramatically dropped as well so there are some people who've lived in some and they've dropped half the miles per gallon or mile range other people like tfl went like 90 i think it was i thought 100 miles before telling me it's 89 miles of of range out of their two, 320 mile truck well, when they I towed they lost the range. Like no. he drove 89 miles because i did watch that video he drove 89 miles and had more that he could have gone but he started to feel anxious and yeah. so that's why he stopped to charge like he could have gone further but he was like, yeah, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to charge now. Yeah. So, I mean, and I think I said that correctly before range anxiety set in. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, he got about hundred. So, uh, and that to me is a real concern because like when you go camping, you typically go to remote locations that you want to spend the weekend with and that those remote locations aren't really close by <laughs> in most cases. And so, and then you also have the problem that, that charging stations aren't set up for pull through charging which that's a big problem for me. You'd have to unhook your camper, drive over, charge your vehicle, drive back, hook your camper up again. And you can get fast hooking up your camper, but you don't want to. You want to make sure you're making no mistakes. And so that, I think there's some concern there. Now, is that a fixable problem with the pull-through chargers? Yes. That's something that, as you pointed out, EB America can fix. There's things we can fix. There's going to be no problems there. But I, I do think towing is a, is a concern. And like I said, I've been watching these new consumers buy vehicles, and they have not talked about towing that much at all. And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, cost of charge. Now, this is something that I was having lunch with my uncle, and he was shocked to learn that <laughs> charging isn't free. What? Yeah. And, and he's just like, he thought he'd just pull up anywhere and just charge his car for free. And so Jill is currently working on an extended version of the story. She's looking at maintenance costs, charging at home costs, charging road trip costs. She's, she went down a rabbit hole today. 
I, I totally went down a rabbit hole. I love the rabbit hole. So sometimes those produce the best stories. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I can't wait to read it because um, in TFL's case, they basically saved a hundred bucks or so by driving EV versus a gas truck, but it, they ran up about five hours more of a charging according to their spreadsheet. And I, what I said was how many times did they stop and grab a pop or grab a, something to snack on while they're waiting for the thing to charge. And I appreciate that there are people in the comments saying that you can get 10 to 80% charge in 15, 20 minutes or whatever the case may be. And that's fine in an ideal world. But when you're road tripping, I want to have full power because I, I, I don't want to stop as often. And so I think there's, I think there's some interesting discussions happening with that. So, I mean, the one thing I do want to point out is actually most EV, and I know there are some EV guys in here probably, um, but from what I understand, most electric car companies say you should actually not charge above 80%. Like when you're, when you're doing an, a road trip, that that actually, it will basically double the time that you have to charge. So you can get to 80% in 15 minutes, but then it'll take another 30 for you to get to 100 so they're, they're like, it doesn't make sense for you. If you if you can have enough range to get to the next station, you're going to be saving a lot of time and a lot of energy um, just by going up to 80% and then moving on to the next one. But I mean, and you're looking at it like, well, but I'm sitting here for an hour. Yeah, but you're sitting here like total. Okay, you're sitting here for an hour. But if you did one to 80% and the next one to 80%, you'd only be spending a half an hour. So you actually would get more time by charging to 80% rather than going all the way to 100%. And I think you're right on that. And I think the same thing we've learned with cell phones and things, but it's going to have to be a changed consumer viewpoint on that in that trying to get the consumers to be well aware of that change. So I, I think it's going to be a long time till the consumers hop onto that bandwagon. Um, so we're talking more about that. Premium price electric trucks. It's something that, you know, if you haven't shopped for one, go shop for one. Go on the Ford.com and shop. Go to Rivian and shop for one. Um, they're expensive. That's, I mean, that, that's kind of, that's, I want to say, they're inexpensive. They're very expensive to buy. Uh, we're going to do some more stuff on cost ownership, do some more stuff on that kind of stuff. But they're pretty expensive. And when you look at, like, I picked on Ford here because, well, didn't really pick on them because they're the only, only option, really, right, to do moment. comparisons. Yeah, I mean, I was able to buy a, what I consider a very cons comparable truck, Although I did opt for the better, the 2.7 liter engine versus the 3.3. Um, and I found price difference to be about $20,000. And that's quite a bit of chunk of change when you look at, you know, what we're, what we're spending on gas. And some people spend more on gas than other people do. I mean, the average was, I went to CNBC or something, and they said it was, we're spending $5,000 a year on gas. But if you, it was only $2,800 last year, $3,800 recently is March. And gas is currently going down. I think I just saw a report. Every day they expected it to drop a couple cents here and there because crude oil prices drop quite a bit because there's but, a lot of fears of recession. So I, it fluctuates. It I, fluctuates quite a bit. I also want to point out though, because like part of the the, the analysis that I'm going to do is I'm looking at the base XLT to the base XLT. So you know the base 3.3 liter engine with the you know to the standard range battery, and that cost difference is really only five thousand dollars. So if people are spending five thousand dollars a year in gas, if you bought that specific. For lightning, um, you would make your money back in a year. Yeah, if you were able to get one and get the lottery ticket. I know. I the, everything is in a perfect world. <laughs> blah blah blah. Whatever. Um, but I'm just saying, like you completely exaggerated your point here. And so I just want to do a real cost analysis of, I, and I'm going to look at both trucks. I'm going to look at the the 2.7 um, liter as well as the 3.3 liter in addition to the standard range versus extended range of the XLT and I'm gonna I'm gonna compare them both but I just think you over exaggerated your point here and it's not really a twenty thousand dollar difference okay so moving along the tech is cool, which is something that <laughs> and, and that's all we have to say about that moving on that. I'm gonna wait till your article comes out because I think I think we'll both be surprised at different things I yeah. think we'll both I think we'll both have takeaways from that argument. Um, this is a straight quote from Jill, but the tech is cool, Jim, cause, Tim, because as she said in the minute videos. So, and I've seen this a lot in videos. I've seen this a lot and people talking about the new lightning. They're like, hey, I got power on board plug in. I got zone lighting. I got the big screen, this kind of stuff. And they're, they're talking about these features they have in this truck and how cool it is. And I'm like, well, those features existed before. So I, that's one of the things I'm surprised with is that the lightning doesn't have a lot that's different than the Ford F50 in the power boost. There are power on board plugins. There's zone lighting. There's a bigger, the big screen. Now 
Lightning's got a bigger, bigger screen. <laughs> yeah, bigger, <laughs> you know? bigger screen. Bigger, bigger screen. I mean, so I mean, that's why I just I'm amazed with the stuff that there's um there's a lot about tech and, and the frunk is cool, not cool, depending how you look at it. Um, I don't I think it could be cool for certain. Oh yeah, because he there. wouldn't put his golf clubs in there because he but, wants yeah. to take them out of his truck every day. Exactly. So uh, you know, I think there's a lot to be said as far as that kind of stuff. And I just was it's just surprising to me that I get so much feedback. But again, as you said, if somebody's not buying a new truck except for once every eight years, this doesn't look really cool. Like, for example, I had a 2014 Tundra, and in the mirror had a little little image of his backup camera. That's how they used to do it back then, a little square yeah. about this big. And my aunt was like, oh, my God, it's awesome, right? And I was talking to my uncle who had bought New Sienna. I will never give up my backup camera. I love that backup camera, right? And But he's the average age of his vehicle is like 1965 because he has about 10 different old classic vehicles. And so I just I, – I, I think you'll see that more and more happening – is people are talking about this tech, all this stuff. Well, you don't have to go lightning to get that tech. You can just go power boost too. I mean, they both kind of work. Um, yeah. Oh, gears and gadgets on here. Dan's on here. Uh, I just was gonna watch Dan's video. Dan, your your truck was in the shop for three months, was it? He bought a power boost right after. Um, I'm gonna say right after about time I got mine, and uh, he has had. <laughs> people think I've had problems with trucks I bought. Dan has had some problems. <laughs> Dan is, I've been watching some of his stuff. I've been back and forth on some of his stuff. I catch him when I can, but he, he just got his truck back. And then I think he went and got new tires for it. Did he get new tires, wheels for it, Dan? Anyways. Um, all right. So I'm just going through the comments right now to see what I missed. Uh, why the change in start time? No, it's not viewership, Richard. It, Jill had a dinner reservation tonight. Um, yeah, the, the charging 80%, 900% also extends battery lifetime capacity and health. I think I've, you've seen that too with cell phones. So like my new self, my cell phone mm -hmm. now says optimal charging is done like at 4 a.m. And so they're trying to, you know, they're trying to get better at the battery usage because I've heard that as well with superchargers and the Tesla network where there's concerns about using superchargers too often and it actually degrades the battery. Mm -hmm. And look, I was looking at a story today. There's, the thing is, there's been a lot of stories like the EVs. And so I've actually been reading a lot of stuff because I'm just really curious. But uh, battery cost replacements like at ten thousand dollars right now. That's what they're that's what they're they're saying. Um, and somebody said that's the same cost replacing an engine in a vehicle. And I was kind of like, you know what? It actually kind of is. I'm putting seven thousand in the suite of the new engine. And by the time he's new engine transmission, by the time it's all done, I think the engine's gonna cost like four thousand plus labor. I mean, so you're not too far off. Um, so yeah, I, I, but my concern with the battery situation currently is typically in consumer electronics you get twice as fast for half the cost is what happens over years of time so your computer gets twice as fast half of the cost it just chips get better processing speed gets better my concern is with the lithium in the batteries becoming more of a desired resource that you're seeing lithium pricing go up you're seeing cobalt pricing go up and so i think you're going to see battery pricing that had gone down in the past couple of years. I think as we get more demand of those more raw resources, I think you'll see pricing either stay consistent or go up a little bit. I think most EVs are going to be a little bit more expensive for the short time. Uh, for a for a, an intermediate immediate part of time, you'll see a little more expensive going up. Okay. Yeah, Jill is a. She might, that's, I don't know why Jill's not taking a stab at me. I don't know. She's, uh, there's no well, stab. No, I'm not stabbing my heart. Yeah. What are you tired tonight or something? I'm just reading the comments. I'm ignoring you. <laughs> That's what happened there. Actually, if I'm being honest, I stopped listening. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> Does that work as a stab in the heart for you? Yeah. Uh, that's my stab. <laughs> uh, no noticeable drop in quality levels of total foreigners because again, Infotainment is the biggest culprit these days, and the, the forerunner doesn't have much for entertainment anymore. Um, does not have the same kind of setup. So, um, holy cow, that's been an hour. That was a quick hour. Hmm. Amazing how fast this goes. You start rambling and talking. So, uh, let's see. We talked about uh, new qual truck quality kitchen early in the podcast. We talked about which truck to buy. We talked about EVs. We talked about Dodge Hornet. We talked about the plug-in hybrid trucks uh jill had her finger raised yeah um, no there's one more thing i do Let's believe she does look hungry I, I think you're right there dave in canada well, she does look looks hungry you know i always tell her to eat a damn cheeseburger just so i don't look uh, so big on camera we, she does she actually does eat cheeseburgers it's i, just, I do I um 
No, I, well, you know, our friend Aaron Gold, um, he always says that I look like um, I need to eat, um, what is it, a, a, a sandwich with extra mayonnaise. <laughs> Uh, no, but uh, let's see. So this this is what I wanted to, to talk about briefly, um, just as our, our parting shot. Oh, uh, yes. So uh, you guys know I'm doing Rebel in um, October, and we actually now have our logo um, and our team name, so the Brute Squad. And uh, it kind of, the, the press release doesn't say this, but it came from um, The Princess Bride. Apparently there's something with Lee Gals and you can't mention a name of a movie and a press, I don't know. But it actually came from The Princess Bride when we were talking about, um, you know, when the Andre the Giant knocks on Billy Crystal's door and he opens the door and says, I'm going to call the Brood Squad. And he's like, I'm on the Brood Squad. And Billy Crystal says, you are the Brood Squad. And so... My partner and I, Kristen Shaw, um, were like, we are the Brood Squad because we're both relatively petite and the truck we're driving is petite. And I was like, small people can be the Brood Squad. I've been a bouncer before. Um, so we are the, I have been. Um, so we are the the, the Brood Squad. And um, I also want to give a shout out to my sister, Jennifer, who designed the logo. Yes. So. Yeah, it looks, it looks great. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I think, we saw it about the same time it came, press release came out this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So it is exciting. Brute Squad is going to be going. We have lots of cool stuff happening in the fall. Um, ooh, Dan wants to know, should I trade my power boost for a TRX or an et 4 x I trade it for whatever you can buy these days. <laughs> but no, uh, Brute Squad is coming out this fall. We're going to have lots of video. We have to get out. We have to make a plan, Jill. We have to get out there and do some video with you and Christian and Truck. We haven't yes. done that. We got to get that done. So that's, on our, that's on our bucket list. Um, coming up this week, this month is going to be exciting. This this is going to be exciting. I'm excited. I'm going to do some traveling. I'm getting out of the, the house. Um, I'm going to head out to uh, Toyota in Austin in a, in a week and a half or so, I think it is. And there's a new vehicle being delivered, or just not delivered, but revealed. New vehicle being revealed from Toyota that we don't really know. We, rumors are it's the Toyota Crown, which is some sort of sedan SUV combination, something, something. or other. Yeah, we don't really know. Um, so we're going to see that more about that. And then uh, Chevy Colorado gets unveiled this, this month. And so I'm going to go to Michigan and see that. So I got that cool stuff happening. In August, uh, Phil and I are made, I think we found, found this plan. We're going to Overland Expo Mountain West and here in Colorado. And so hanging out a couple days. We're going to do the um, Tundra TRD Pro and Tacoma TRD Pro, I think, back to back in the mountains in Colorado. So that should be some fun videos coming from that. Um, and I feel like Jill is going to be in California for a bell that same week training. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to then... do Palisade. I'm going to do at the beginning of August. Um, yep. so that's coming up. So those things look forward to. And, and like I said, I think there's more stuff coming this fall. I think a lot of PR is just off the July, take it to vacation. And so I anticipate a lot of good stuff coming in August and September, including end of the debacle, what Tim's going to do for a new truck. That should be ending this year because I have to do something. So that's what we got. Uh, I think that's all we got going on. Yeah, I'm going to Overland Expo Mountain Mountain West. It's a little smaller event, and so I'm not, not as big as other events, but it should be cool. So uh, that's what we got for you this week. Make sure you check us out on next week's live stream. I there's I think I'll be here for that one. No, let me see. Uh, let me double check this. Um, the 14th. Oh. I will be live from Austin with Jill. <laughs> I think that's what's going to happen. So we'll make that happen or something like that. Okay. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, I, I'll be in Austin that night. So maybe we can do something before dinner or something like that. So we're going to do that. And then, um, yeah, lots of cool stuff happening. Check out the website, pickuptrucktalk.com. Social media, Pick Up Truck Talk. Oh, I forgot the banner. I can't believe I forgot the brand. I, I made this whole thing happen, and then I totally forgot it. Boom. Pickuptrucktalk.com. Pick Up Truck Talk for all social media. As always, thanks for watching. We will see you down the road.